The public reaction to the discovery of Pluto was ecstatic, particularly in the United States, whose citizens saw it as the first American planet, and, rightly, as a sign of the slowly shifting center of global gravity from Europe to America. The UFO craze was nearly two decades away, and Sputnik a decade after that, but having entered the zeitgeist alongside Buck Rogers and Flash Gordon, Pluto could very well be called the first planet of the space age. Contrary to popular belief, there is no solid evidence that Walt Disney definitely named Mickey's dog after the planet, but the fact that Pluto the pup showed up so soon after Pluto the planet does suggest that the name was in the air at the time. Among scientists, though, Pluto's reception was more measured, particularly as the pre-covery images came in, and they realized just how odd Clyde Tombaugh's world truly was. When Uranus and Neptune were discovered, no one even idly pondered that there might not be planets. Even before their considerable masses were known, their stately ordered motions through the heavens, lying square on the ecliptic plane, were planetary enough to assuage all doubts. But now, the universe had thrown humanity a cosmic curveball, a planet so crassly unplanet-like that many doubted it could be a planet at all. For a start, its orbit was abnormally stretched out. All planets orbit the sun in ellipses, rather than perfect circles, but their stretch is so minuscule it took centuries of observation to notice. No one could mistake Pluto's orbit for a circle. The difference between its farthest and nearest approaches to the sun is a full 40%, compared to just 3% for Earth. Even weirder, Pluto's orbit was wildly tilted, like a boat listing in an ecliptic sea. The other planets lay in staid, flat orbits, hardly budging from the desert road of the ecliptic plane. But Pluto's orbit took it almost as far above the ecliptic as Saturn is from the Sun. Strangest of all, for a small fraction of its deformed orbit, Pluto actually passed within the orbit of Neptune, meaning that for almost exactly 20 of the 248 years it took to orbit the Sun, Pluto would not be the ninth planet. Given that Pluto was already known to show no disk, and to be six times fainter than Lowell had predicted, the idea that it could be a planet, let alone Planet X, was beginning to seem tenuous. Pluto's features and habits were peculiar for a planet, but par for the course for other objects in the solar system, such as comets and asteroids. Except asteroids are never found alone, and comets had never been observed so far from the Sun. So what was Pluto? In an article in the New York Times, published shortly after Pluto's announcement, two astronomers, Harlow Shapley, director of the Harvard Observatory, and Armin O. Leuchner, co-founder of the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, put forth their own ideas. To Leuchner, Pluto was likely, quote, a large asteroid greatly disturbed in its orbit by close approach to a major planet, such as Jupiter, or one of many long-period planetary objects yet to be discovered, or a bright cometary object. While Shapley suggested it may be, quote, a member of the solar system not comparable with known asteroids and comets, and perhaps of greater importance to cosmogony, then would be another major planet beyond Neptune. Both these men's words would prove prophetic, though it would be the better part of a century before anyone knew that. To the staff at the Lowell Observatory, this rising controversy was petrifying. Had Tombaugh not actually located Planet X? And if not, what had he found? Perhaps Pluto was merely one of Planet X's moons, meaning that Planet X was waiting in plain sight for anyone eyeing Pluto to stumble across. Slipher would not allow Planet X to slip from the Lowell Observatory's grasp, so he took the only action he trusted. He ordered Tom Baugh to continue his search, to be absolutely certain that Pluto was alone. And so, Tom Baugh once again trained his eye on the blink comparator. His previous search had taken him eight months and required the examination of two million stars. This longer leg of the trek would see him return from college every summer until 1939. By 1943, when World War II ended his planet-hunting days for good, Tombaugh had checked 45 million stars. By then, bar the five years to pursue his master's degree, he had sat at the Lowell's Blink Comparator for 14 years and logged over 7,000 hours of work. His tally of odd objects totaled 775 asteroids, one comet, several galaxy clusters, including one supercluster, the identification of NGC 5694, a fuzzy blob first observed by William Herschel in 1784 as a globular cluster, but only one planet. As far as Tombaugh could tell, Pluto was alone. And if he couldn't tell, 
no one could. Tama had always assumed that other people saw the world as he did, but the constant amazement of his fellow astronomers at his ability to casually spot movements at 15th magnitude told him otherwise. The unassuming drudger had gained a level of fame and respect that far outshone his actual position. Tombaugh's professor at university, the wonderfully named Dinsmore Alter, had dismissed his pupil's suggestion that the discoverer of the ninth planet take the introductory astronomy class, even though Tombaugh thought it might be fun. Come World War II, Tombaugh was drafted to teach navigation. Not merely astronavigation, which would have been a breeze for him, but full-on navigation. Everything from dead reckoning to map and compass to radio. Tombaugh knew nothing of this, and spent the war in a state of frenzied learning to stay just ahead of his own students. When Tombaugh returned from the war, he had every right to expect that the bosom of the Lowell Observatory would be there to embrace him. But he was wrong. Tombaugh had always suspected that Vesto Slifer, the head of the observatory, secretly resented the fame and respect Tombaugh had gained for discovering Pluto, which Slifer felt should have gone to Lowell, and by extension, his observatory. Pluto was supposed to be the Lowell's key to scientific respectability, but despite their attempts to play up Lowell's role in Pluto's discovery while playing down Tombaugh's, it was Tombaugh, not Lowell, who had ultimately received the lion's share of acclaim. Tombaugh had also not considered the insecurity of his position. For all the fame and adulation he had received, he was still just a layman, working under credited astronomers, and it would be years before he gained the titles reflective of his talent. All this meant that the observatory his home away from home for nearly twenty years, had become a far more hostile and precarious place for him. In 1946, ostensibly for financial reasons, Slifer had Tombaugh summarily fired. Thankfully, Tombaugh would not be left stranded for long. His brother-in-law had managed to secure him a job that was, not to put too fine a point on it, simply too cool to turn down. Upon taking the job, Tombo was given a military rank and whisked off to the alien landscape of White Sands, New Mexico, and to the newly formed missile range, where he would lead a team to calibrate the telescopes used to test fire captured Nazi V-2 rockets. In 1947, one of these rockets would record the first images of the Earth from space, the first step to the space race that would culminate in the moonshot 20 years later. New Mexico would become Clyde Tombo's home and he would eventually found the astronomy program at New Mexico State University, where he attained a professorship and would lecture for the rest of his life, even after retirement. Over time, the serious-minded young man had become known for his sense of humor, and even belatedly developed a mild case of Planet Hunter's eccentricity, throwing his weight behind the earliest reports of UFOs. Tombo's role in this story is not over, but I'm afraid we have to leave him for now, and return to Flagstaff, Arizona, though not the Lowell Observatory. In 1955, the U.S. Naval Observatory, America's equivalent of the Royal Greenwich Observatory, established an outpost at Flagstaff after the idea of observing stars from Washington, D.C. became ridiculous. Lowell may or may not have been vindicated by Pluto, but at the very least, his government had seen fit to vindicate his choice of viewing location. In 1962, the Flagstaff station recruited a promising young student named James Christie, who had yet to even receive a bachelor's, as part of a program to observe Soviet space launches. The Sputniks had put the heat on the U.S. military's astronomical community, who determined to keep eyes on them until they crashed. But that didn't mean more traditional astronomy was forgotten. In 1965, an astronomer named Otto Franz asked Christie's opinion about a strange image of Pluto he'd just taken. It appeared oddly distended, as if Pluto were about to give birth. Christie concluded that the photo was overexposed, and handing it back to France, promptly forgot about it. The following decade would be inauspicious for Christie. Both his children fell ill, his brother died in a car crash, and he and his wife would ultimately divorce. On top of that, he was transferred to the U.S. Naval Observatory's original location in Washington, D.C., where he was ordered to undertake a task so tedious even Clyde Tombaugh might have blanched at it. Using a projector called Star Scan, essentially a blink comparator that didn't blink, to accurately measure the angular distances between thousands of individual stars. The job gave him headaches, but he kept at it. In 1975, Christie married again to a woman with whom he was head over heels in love. Charlene, nicknamed Char. This event would prove to have a far greater impact on the history of Pluto than Christie likely first suspected. By 1978, the focus of his job had shifted to accurate measurements of the distances between Uranus and its moons, in preparation for the arrival of Voyager 2 in 1986. 
He proposed to his superiors that such techniques might also be employed to locate moons around Pluto, but was rejected. After all, Gerard Kuiper, the greatest planetary astronomer of the 20th century and Christie's professor, had searched for a moon of Pluto with the 200-inch Hale telescope and found nothing. So if he couldn't see it, how could a lowly data cruncher who didn't even have a PhD? Yeah, as if we needed more evidence that people never learn. On the 22nd of June, 1978, Christie had finished his chores five days early and was preparing to take some well-earned vacation time to settle with his wife into their new house, when his boss, Robert Sutton Harrington, offered him a bonus project to double-check some Pluto images just in from Flagstaff labeled defective. The images appeared to show Pluto elongated and distended, but Christie, perhaps spurred by the memory of the images he'd seen more than a decade earlier, had suspicions. For one thing, the stars were not similarly elongated, and also, the same image, taken a month later, showed the distension on Pluto's opposite side. The defect was apparently orbiting Pluto. At that point, Christie lifted his eyes from his star scan and declared to the empty room, Pluto has a moon. The room's response is not recorded, but when Christie delivered a similar proclamation to Harrington, Harrington's response was memorably concise. Jim, you're crazy. But, once again, the great savior of the solar system's oddballs, Precovery, came to the rescue, and the moon's orbit was shown to be constant in images going back ten years. Soon, another observatory confirmed the discovery, and Christie was left with a daunting personal challenge. What to call it? By his own admission, Christie knew nothing about mythology, so while his more mythically-minded superiors were urging to name the moon Persephone, after the wife of Pluto, Christie was considering other priorities. As I said, he was deeply in love with his wife Char, and whilst on a car trip to visit her parents, he declared to her that he would name the moon Charon, as if it were one of her subatomic particles. At the time, he had no idea if Charon had any mythical relevance whatsoever. He merely thought it sounded vaguely scientific. But the IAU would refuse a name not taken from a relevant mythology. Four days after his discovery, While lying awake in bed in his new home, he began to wonder, could Sharon somehow be made to fit the mythological scheme? On a whim, he grabbed a flashlight, the power had yet to be turned on, and rummaged through the boxes to find his encyclopedia. Turning to the relevant page, he stared in astonishment. There it was. Charon, the ferryman who led the souls of the dead across the river Styx and into Pluto's realm. That was it. Case as far as Christie was concerned, closed. Many husbands promised their wives the moon, said Charlene years later. Mine delivered. To this day, many American astronomers still pronounce the moon's name Charon, rather than the more correct Charon or Charon, in oblique reference to this tale of planetary romance. Charlene may not have known it, but her little moon would unleash a swarm of dragons. The astronomers at the U.S. Naval Observatory immediately saw the implications of Christie's discovery. Once they knew Pluto had a moon, a simple application of Newton's laws would finally grant them the value they had sought for decades, its mass. Was Pluto really a giant, stormy planet X, or simply an oversized asteroid? In their paper announcing Charon's discovery, Christie and Harrington also announced the mass that they'd calculated for Pluto. And it was, frankly, shocking. Pluto was a mere 0.0017 an Earth mass, less than one five hundredth. Even our relatively small moon was six times heavier. The conclusion was stark. Nothing with a mass so vanishingly small could ever have caused the supposed discrepancies in Uranus's orbit. Whatever else Pluto may or may not have been, it had never been planet X. With this realization... Robert Harrington was seized with a fiery certainty. Planet X was still out there, waiting to be found. Wittingly or not, Harrington's quest to find Planet X would open the most confoundingly weird chapter of this already strange story. To aid him in his quest for Planet X, or Planet 10 as it could now be called, since it was no longer Planet 9, Harrington sought the help of a 27-year-old postdoc at the observatory's almanac office, Tom Van Flandern. Van Flandern had already pressured Harrington to launch a search for such a planet based on his own familiarity with the residuals in Uranus's orbit, 
which now also included Neptune's orbits, of which they had now observed a far larger fraction than in Lowell's day. Harrington had initially dismissed the idea, but once the true nature of Pluto had been revealed, embraced it with passion. The two began their search by looking for any fingerprints Planet X, or as Harrington for some reason christened it, Humphrey, may have left on the known solar system. And that meant Neptune. One of Neptune's peculiarities is that it is the only planet with a large irregular satellite. Irregular in this case does not mean irregularly shaped, although most of them are, but that its orbit around its planet differed from the flat, circular, planetary orbits of, quote, regular satellites like our own. In the case of Neptune's moon, named Triton, it had been known for some time that its orbit, unlike that of any other large moon in the solar system, was retrograde. It orbited Neptune in the opposite direction to Neptune's rotation. Earlier attempts to explain Triton's orbital oddness had centered on Pluto being an escaped satellite of Neptune that had disrupted Triton while moving to its new orbit. Well, that idea was out. Pluto was too small to do that. But an unknown planet lurking out there in the darkness? That was a possibility. Harrington and Van Flandern ran several computer models until they arrived at a scenario that matched their speculations. An object five times the mass of Earth at between 50 and 100 AU between one and a quarter and two and a half times Pluto's distance from the Sun. Between 1979 and 1987, Harrington would launch seven separate searches for Humphrey, though at the end he would admit that he had, quote, nothing to show for my efforts. Perhaps it was news of Harrington's search, but there was no denying that the 1980s were a time of Planet X fever. Various Planet Xs were proposed by numerous astronomers, some plausible, some ridiculous, but most stayed within scientific circles and only rarely connected with the wider world. One notable exception was the initial publication of the findings of the Infrared Astronomical Satellite, or IRAS, which spent seven months observing the sky in the infrared spectrum from above our obscuring atmosphere in 1983. A tentative summation of the findings, published in the Astronomical Journal in 1984, proposed several different explanations for an array of initially unidentifiable objects including high infrared galaxies, a circumsolar dust cloud, or a cold object, quote, with the same diameter as Jupiter at a distance of approximately 570 AU, unquote, about 14 times Pluto's distance from the Sun. The paper noted that follow-up observations in the next six months could determine if this hypothetical object existed. But, as always happens when the cautious advance of science collides with the impatient, gossip-hungry press, the team's speculations were immediately distorted. In December 1983, months before the paper was published, the Washington Post brazenly claimed on its front page that, quote, a heavenly body possibly as large as the giant planet Jupiter and possibly so close to Earth that it would be part of our solar system has been found, unquote. While technically true, this statement was immensely misleading. The IRAS scientists had never even suggested that the mystery object was definitely a planet, and subsequent observations showed that none of these objects were within our solar system or for that matter, within our galaxy, save for one, a wisp of interstellar cloud. Nevertheless, as the Roswell incident has shown, a single hasty newspaper headline can spawn havoc decades later, and to the current Planet X doomsday crowd, the admission and subsequent, quote, cover-up implied by the article has become their event one. The ultimate irony is that, in that very same Washington Post article held aloft as gospel by the doomsayers, Dr. Gary Neugebauer, one of the scientists interviewed for the piece, attempted to stem any speculation that the object might be headed for Earth. Quote, It's not incoming mail. I want to douse that idea with as much cold water as I can. Unquote. In 1984, two paleontologists, David Raup and Jack Sapkowski, published a paper claiming a discovery so staggering that it could utterly collapse and reform our perception of ourselves and our place in the universe. They claimed, after conducting a statistical analysis of species extinction over the previous 250 million years, that there existed a pattern in the frequency of mass extinctions, with events occurring with remarkable regularity every 26 million years. The idea seemed preposterous. Nothing on Earth, even continental movements, operates with such constancy over such a vast span of time. What possible mechanism could trigger such clockwork pulses of mass death? It was then that physicist Richard A. Muller attacked the question by rethinking it. If nothing on Earth is your answer, then your answer must lie beyond Earth. 
Muller was a colleague and friend of the notoriously combative but brilliantly eccentric physicist Luis Alvarez, who had first proposed, to near-universal opposition among paleontologists, that the dinosaurs had met their demise at the sharp end of a colliding asteroid. When Muller presented the evidence to Alvarez, Alvarez initially refused to countenance it, but eventually narrowed the choices of possible mechanism. Asteroids were too close to Earth to be triggered on such a time scale. But comets, which lie as far as a thousand times the distance to Pluto, could be. Muller's proposed solution to the puzzle reads less like a scientific hypothesis than an apocalyptic myth. Somewhere, over a light year away, at the outer edge of our sun's gravitational reach, there lies a small, red star, so dim and so glacial in its movement as to be imperceptible to those not looking for it. The star makes its epoch-spanning orbit of our sun every 26 million years, most of which is spent out in the nothingness of interstellar space. But eventually, its orbit takes it to its closest point to the sun, where its gravity disrupts the outer solar system's comet cloud, known as the Oort cloud, sending swarms of deadly comets into the inner reaches of the solar system, where one would inevitably collide with Earth. Muller chose a suitably mythical name for this cosmic doom-bringer. Nemesis, after the Greek goddess of divine retribution. In keeping with the spirit of the time, The Return of the Jedi had only just been released the previous year, and Ronald Reagan's strategic defense initiative was already known as Star Wars, he later nicknamed Nemesis the Death Star. Needless to say, the scientific reaction to Nemesis was guarded. Many astronomers responded that not only had no binary stars with such incredibly long orbital periods ever been observed, but Nemesis' gargantuan orbit would be unstable over the edge of the solar system, and would have been pulled into interstellar space long before now by the gravity of passing stars. Muller countered that yes, it may be unstable, but it doesn't need to orbit the sun forever, only up to now. One possible solution to the stability problem was proposed by physicists Daniel Whitmire and John Matisse of the University of Louisiana, an idea that fused the Nemesis hypothesis with a peculiarly quirky take on Planet X. They suggested that Rather than a star with a 26 million year orbit, a largest planet with an orbital period not much longer than Pluto's, about 250 years, might be able to produce similar effects by nudging against the inner, disc-shaped region of the Oort cloud. This was prior to the discovery and naming of the Kuiper Belt, incidentally. How, you ask, can a planet with a 250 year orbit affect catastrophic changes on time scales 100,000 times longer? Well, that's where the quirky bit comes in. Matisse and Whitmire imagined the planet's orbit could precess, much like Mercury's orbit, over the course of a hundred thousand revolutions. Precession is best imagined as a slow rotation of an object's entire orbit, only rather than horizontally, Matisse and Whitmire's object would precess vertically, rising and falling onto the ecliptic plane like the slowest mouse trap in the universe. Every 26 million years, the planet's orbit would intersect with the ecliptic plane, comets would be jostled, and the trap would be sprung. In case you were wondering, no, modern telescope surveys of the region beyond Pluto have not picked up this object, and it almost certainly does not exist. This, however, would not be Matisse and Whitmire's last tangle with trans-Neptunian planets. In 1999, they challenged the accepted conclusion that long-period comets have completely random points of origin, the observation that led to proposing the Oort cloud, by arguing that some Oort cloud comets cluster in a band inclined to the ecliptic plane. This overabundance of comets from a particular region of the sky, they argued, could have resulted from their having been disrupted by the orbit of a large planet, perhaps the size of Jupiter, lying some 15,000 AU, or 3,000 times Pluto's distance, from the Sun. Other astronomers never fully accepted their data, claiming that their sample size of comets was too small for the results to be statistically significant. For over a decade, Matisse and Whitmire stuck to their guns, insisting that their data was more than just random noise. And then, in 2011, they went for broke, blitzing the media with a stream of articles claiming that their object would soon be found. They even gave it a media-friendly name, Tyche, after the good sister of Nemesis, despite the fact that it was a planet, not a star, and nowhere near where Nemesis was predicted to be. Of course, their media frenzy led to an increased panic in the midst of the 2012 Planet X hysteria. The reason for their burst of reckless optimism was the then-imminent publication of the full data set from WISE, the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer, the modern successor to IRAS, only 500 times more powerful. 
If their planet existed, they asserted, Wise would find it. Well, Wise didn't find it, and in fact put the kibosh on any Jupiter-sized planet out to 26,000 AU, or nearly double Tyche's supposed distance. Incidentally, Wise pretty much put the kibosh on Nemesis as well, with scientific opinion shifting into the no-camp. But what about the initial finding? The periodicity of mass extinctions that set the Nemesis idea in motion in the first place? Surprisingly, that question remains open, with about as many scientific papers asserting that it is real as those asserting that it isn't. Given that interpretations of the data rely so much on base assumptions, how many extinctions are an event? How close to 26 million years is regular? Do we even have a large enough sample of the fossil record to make the assertion? The question is not likely to be resolved anytime soon. In January 1993, Robert Harrington died after a short battle with esophageal cancer at the age of 51. Conspiracy websites have claimed that his death was, quote, mysterious. But while dying quickly and relatively young of cancer is tragic, it is hardly uncommon. By then, he had run out of funding for his search, but there is little evidence that he had lost faith in Planet X. It is interesting to speculate what his thoughts would have been had he lived just a little longer. For only three months after his death, mathematical astronomer E. Miles Standish delivered what many consider to be the final killing blow to the entire concept of Planet X. For decades... Planet X had been slowly wasting away. As knowledge of celestial mechanics increased, and observational precision improved, more and more of the residuals in Uranus's and Neptune's orbits were being accounted for, and the remainder, i.e. Planet X, was becoming smaller and smaller. In 1915, Lowell had predicted Planet X to be seven times the mass of the Earth. By 1931, estimates were revised to one Earth mass. By 1955, Planet X had become slightly less massive than Earth, and by 1971, it had fallen to just 11% Earth's mass, or, if you prefer, roughly the mass of Mars. Planet X's position was becoming increasingly precarious. One good gust might just scatter it to the air. That gust came in the form of Voyager 2, the hardy craft whose monumental 12-year mission had taken it to each of the four largest planets in our solar system, including to date, our only rendezvous with Uranus and Neptune. When Voyager passed by Neptune in 1989, it was able to provide the first truly accurate measurement of the planet's mass, and found it to be 0.6% less than predicted. 0.6% may not seem like much, but slimming Neptune by that amount was the equivalent of removing a planet the size of Mars from the solar system. Wait, did I just say a planet the size of Mars? When Miles Standish applied Neptune's new mass to Uranus's ephemeris, the residuals, also known as Planet X, disappeared. To this day, the vast majority of scientists consider this finding to be the death of Planet X. As if to put icing on that cake, on the 11th of July 2011, Neptune completed its first revolution around the Sun since its discovery, its orbit unblemished. One who did disagree with the consensus quite vociferously, in fact, was Tom Van Flandern, who, after the death of his colleague Harrington, determined to go to bat for Planet X, even in the face of all but conclusive evidence. Admittedly, his way around said evidence was nothing if not inventive. In 1847, as part of the effort to locate precovery observations of Neptune to lock down its orbit, Sears Cook Walker, an assistant at the U.S. Naval Observatory, located a series of observations made in 1795 by the French revolutionary astronomer Jérôme Joseph Lalande. Over the course of two nights in May 1795, Lalande, actually his nephew, recorded two observations of a star that appeared to change position between viewings. Either Lalande or his nephew decided that the movement was due to observational error and threw the first one out. And so the eighth planet missed being discovered just 14 years after the seventh. Here's the problem. Lalande's Neptune observations were off the predicted position by eight arc seconds, which is double Lalande's average observational error. Even Miles Standish, a man of instinctive precision who spent most of his career plotting the future positions of planets in preparation for split-second time spacecraft rendezvous, found the Lalande numbers unsettling. Unfortunately, as he pointed out, without photographic evidence to back them up, there's no way to validate them. In 1980, an even more striking set of recovery images was unearthed by Planet X hunter Charles Kowal, about whom I will have more to say in the next episode. 
As part of a project to trace back Neptune planetary conjunctions through time, Kowal unearthed three observations of Neptune by no less than Galileo Galilei. Not only had Galileo recorded Neptune, he had also recorded its motion, though, since he had even less reason to assume a new planet than Lalande, he never followed it up. Galileo's recorded position was even farther off the predicted ephemeris than Lalande. Could this be evidence of a distant planet X? Van Flanders certainly thought so, and imagined an object with an orbit so elongated that it only passed close to Neptune once every few centuries, or every other Neptune orbit. But even Kowal eventually concluded that Galileo's observations were inaccurate. After all, he was simply recording a background star, not looking for a planet. To Miles Standish, the choice was fairly obvious. You could either assume that five handwritten notes of observations made through antiquated telescopes without cameras by people who weren't even looking for planets were slightly in error, or you could insert an entirely new planet into the solar system. Standish and Van Flandern had known each other while students at Yale, but once Standish made his position clear, Van Flandern essentially unpersoned him. Until Van Flandern's death in 2009, he and Standish did not speak, avoided each other at conferences, and blasted each other in interviews. If the meticulous Standish were Van Flandern's only opponent, it's possible his idea might have gotten a bigger hearing. Unfortunately, by this point, Van Flandern had, well, gone crazy. In the early 1980s, Van Flandern wrote, Events in my life caused me to start questioning my goals and the correctness of everything I had learned. In matters of religion, medicine, biology, physics, and other fields, I came to discover that reality differed seriously from what I had been taught. He proceeded to tear up everything known about physics for the last four centuries and envision a new reality where gravity didn't exist and planets spontaneously exploded. He even embraced the conspiracy theorist Richard Hoagland's ideas about the face on Mars, now shown to be an optical illusion by higher resolution images. And so, with its last proponent drowning his case in Babel, Planet X after a hundred years, was finally put to rest. If you were an optimist, you might have assumed the solar system was at last in order. Except, it wasn't. Just months before Standish published his findings on Neptune, a pair of maverick astronomers made a discovery that would blow the solar system wide open, usher in a new era of discovery, and lay the ground for the final humiliation of planet Pluto. And we should be learning about that discovery in the next episode.